Mr. Prime Minister, uh, thank you um, for having us here. Um, <clears throat> the whole EU is talking about you again. Um, I see furious statements from various leaders, Olaf Scholz, Ursula von der Leyen, Kaya Kala, so just a few of the reactions um, about your trip uh, to Moscow to meet Putin. What did you want to achieve was it was it? Okay, the Hungarian rotating presidency started 1st of July this year, uh, which means that we have to help the European Union to work better and to achieve certain goals. This is a very technocratic approach. Dossiers, legislatives, competitiveness, very important issues. But we can't neglect the fact that we are living in a very special time. This is wartime. So I think the presidency of the European Union, I mean the European Council, simply cannot afford not to deal with how to get closer to peace and whether is there any chance to close the war, ceasefire or peace talk. So if any rotating European presidency of the Council would not deal with that, that would be hypocrisy. So I, I, I have a strong moral and political motivation that we have to do something. And my estimation is that in the forthcoming two, three months, till the American election, what will, what will happen on the front line? It will be far worse than it was up to now. More, why do, why more, do you think more so? Wep more weapons are there, and the Russians are moving consistently ahead. So the, the, the energy of the confrontation, the number of deaths, the lost lives, uh, the casualties will be more brutal than it was in the last seven uh, months, even the previous period was also very brutal. So what is ahead of us is far worse than we think now. So my, my motivation is that if we would like to do something, and I wish so, and to change from war policy, war supporting policy, to rather to the peace policy, this is the right time to do so. The question is how we can do that. Why do you think so that it will be more brutal? Uh, is your argument that the Russians can't be stopped? Because we see little success also on the Ukrainian side with Western weapons. There was, you know, the Russians tried to go closer to Kharkiv region. They tried uh, to attack in several occasions. It's not the case that the Russians are really having big successes so far this year. I'm not speaking about successes. I'm speaking about energy which is invested into the front line. And I had a chance to have a conversation with the Ukrainian president and the Russian president. And believe me, believe me, that the forthcoming two, three months will be far more brutal than we think. Why do you think so? Did Putin tell you that? No, oh, oh, both sides is very much committed to do so. so Even the Ukrainians are now, they, now they are, I can't say happy because it's not, a proper, not an appropriate expression, but they are more optimistic because they got a good quantity and quality of new weapons and they will use it. So the energy which we confront it on both sides will be different than it was in the previous month. So, so we Europeans, if we would like to get less shadow on the European life of the war, we should act now, not, okay, number one argument is loss is life, yeah? So life which are losses. This is the number one moral motivation. But the second, the self-interest of Europe, because what's going on is very bad for Europe. The argument uh, from EU politicians would be that a trip like you did to Moscow would divide the position inside Europe and to show Putin that Europe is not talking with one voice. Very primitive, very primitive. What I'm doing is not that. Uh, there are five main actors in this very complicated situation. And now I have met two out of the five, uh, Ukrainians, Russians, then United States, then China, then European Union. And I will continue to manage to get and collect the opinions, the position, the talks, how we can formulate to find a way, the quickest way to the ceasefire and to the peace. So I, it was not just a, a dual trip to Kiev and Moscow, it will be continued. What is your idea? How can there be peace? I mean, if we look on the Russian position, the Russians say all the regions, including Saporizhia, Kharkiv, Luhansk, Donetsk, is Russian. 
And they say, you know, we go on and we will fight and we will take at least these regions. They want to destabilize um, the Kiev government. So how can there be peace? Do you see any chance? I mean, what did Putin tell you? The, the, the problem is that you, as many of the European politicians, would like to get a solution immediately by 100%. There is no that kind of solution. How the road to the peace starts is that those who are in the war or surrounding the world would like to have a peace. So that's the most important thing, the intentions, the real human... Because the war is not coming from, 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 from the sky. The <coughs> war is a result of decision of definite persons, you know? So therefore, we have to find those leaders of the world. Hungary is not among them, you, for obvious reasons. Whose decision will decide peace or war? Ukraine is one, Russia also, because finally, at the end of the day, they will make the decision. But very important, what is the approach of China, United States, and European Union? China has a peace plan. America runs a war, war policy. And Europe, instead of having our autonomous, strategical approach and position, we are simply copying the American position. So, sorry to say, but Europe has a war policy as well. So my target is first to understand how we could change the position of those elements, those uh, pillars of the situation, their thinking and approach from war to the peace. If China, United States, and Europe would like to have a, a, a peace, it's far easier for the Ukrainians and the Russians to find a solution how to stop fighting, how to save lives, how to negotiate and find a durable and durable solution. I would argue there's always the question of costs, because the Ukrainians would argue if we give territory to the Russians, our people have to live under Russian law. Uh, that they will torture them, that they will kill them, that they will, you know, um, have to live under under Russian uh, culture. There's no Ukrainian books anymore, no Ukrainian culture, and that they can't accept that. Yeah, I, w I would not like to go into details about the Ukrainian minority policy. You have a conversation now with the Hungarian prime minister. Yeah, but you met Putin and Zelensky and you have but a I know, But I know, but I know how was the situation of the Hungarian minorities living in Zakarpatia, which is part of Ukraine today, uh, treated uh, by the Ukrainian government on education, Hungarian books, and so on. So, so I would not like to criticize well, now Ukraine because they are in war. And when somebody is in war, not the proper time to criticize because their behavior to the Hungarian minorities. But, well, but when, I would argue you but, can't compare that with but, Bucha or other... No, 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 uh, but, but, but yeah. what, I'm, what I'm speaking is... The job for me now is not to say that who is good, who is bad. The situation is obvious. Putin and Russia started the invasion against Ukraine. But I would not like to be indulged into a kind of measurement who is responsible for what and so on. My, my, my duty is to concentrate on how we can create peace. And the only way is that sending clear signals to the fighting parties, guys, we the word would like to have peace, to stop fight, stop killing each other, let's start to negotiate, or at least understand that there is no solution on the ground. Because my starting point of the situation, understanding of the situation is that there is no solution of this conflict on the side of the front line. So the only solution is peace. So therefore, we have to concentrate on that the main actors of the world would like to say, or would be ready to say, peace, policy, what we need. This is not the case today, because we Westerners, we run a war policy. And especially we Europeans, it's difficult to understand because, okay, America is far away. And they have a difficult situation during the discussion of the candidates. We cannot have too many illusions how this country is run at this moment. So it's very difficult to imagine major changes till uh, the American election, which means three, four months till then. And we Europeans should use this situation to have our own autonomous policy. First, because we are closer geographically. Hungary is part of Europe. We are sitting in the cross line of the West and East. So we know how does it work, what the Russians are, how they behave. 
So we Europeans have a better knowledge of this whole situation than the Americans. So we should have a deeper analysis and better understanding of this situation first. Second, the interest of Europe is in danger. Probably the Americans can suffer some losses financially, economically, but the main victim beside the two worrying parties is the European economy and the European people. So therefore, therefore, we Europeans should have our own approach to this whole conflict. And what I see now, there is no real intention to do so, especially because they think that there is nowhere for dialogue. And my trip to Kiev and to Moscow is a clear evidence that there is a way to have direct communication, diplomatic channels, unblocked, and all that kind of it, it, it depends not exclusively on us, but very much depends on us how we would like to argue in favor of peace, not the continuation of the war. Tell us more about um, your trip, especially to Moscow. How is it to shake hands with Vladimir Putin, who, for my opinion, is a war criminal, um, and not only my opinion, but also others, and at the same time, somebody who is appreciating Stalin? Okay, so first of all, we have to understand that what is decided by the war is not who is right and who is bad. It's not about who is right, who has no right. Because each party has always own argument why it is reasonable to go into war. What is decided by a war is who will die and who will stay alive. So don't, don't, don't misunderstand. Sitting in Brussels, sitting in Paris, or close to the Atlantic Ocean, uh, you can have a proper distance to examine in a more theoretical way the war. But the reality of the war is not that. The reality of the war is, is, is a very thorough reality. Peoples are dying every day, thousands now every day on both sides anyway. So therefore, when we are speaking about how to approach from the dimension of truth, uh, responsibility whatsoever is important but not the prime important. The most important thing is how we can stop the bad thing which is going on and killing people each day. So, so don't mix up the approaches to the problem because you, your, your questions are very much relevant tomorrow, but today not. Well, Mr. What Prime is Minister, relevant by, by, today by all, is only yeah. how to stop them. With all the respect, I, I personally know how <laughs> the war looks like. I mean, I spent uh, many months and years at the front line And I talk a lot to soldiers, to Ukrainian citizens, and I can tell you that even though it's brutal for them and many of the soldiers are fighting for more than two years, you don't find many people who are telling you, okay, let's negotiate now, because they say if the Russians you know, come closer to my home, if they come closer to, to my wife, to my mother, You know, I don't want that. That's why we are defending so, Ukraine. So if I understand you correctly, you as a German man, a German guy, try to explain me what does it mean to live close to the Russians? Huh? No. So the point is... No, I, I want to just explain no, you no, how no, this no, at no, the front line, the no, atmosphere no, 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 just, of the Ukrainians. Don't forget that we are sitting in Budapest. So nobody can educate the Hungarians about Russia. I don't want to educate no, you. No, no, no. I just uh, wanted to tell you how the, the situation there is and what people tell me. Even not the Brussels, you know, it's ridiculous. So the point is that Hungary was occupied several times by Russia. Very few person of the world can, can know more about Russia than the Hungarians, and especially the prime minister, because that's my job to understand it. So we know what does it mean. And uh, I can't afford simply not to understand how the Russians think and how to operate. Uh, we, I, I have to repeat, we are not sitting in a very safe part of the world, surrounding only by friends. We are sitting in Budapest, and the meeting point or the division line of the east and west, and the war is just in the next door, next door country. So, so, so we know what's going on, what does it mean Russia, how they think, how they react, and I am sure that Europe cannot afford the luxury not to get be involved directly to communication, not only the Ukrainians, but the Russians also. Otherwise, they will simply not understand what is in their mind. That's why I'm arguing in favor, not about who is right and who is not, because I, my target is peace and ceasefire. The argument 
I hear from the Ukrainian side and also from NATO people and European side is even if there would be a ceasefire now and Putin would accept that, let's say, you know, the, the, the lines, how they are right now, that his strategy would be to rebuild his army and to attack again in two, three, four, five years. So yeah. they would argue, we tried it with Minsk and after Minsk, the full invasion of Ukraine happened um, seven years later. Yeah, the, the, the lessons of the Minsk is a serious issue. So we should think about it. What is the real consequences of that? But I think Mis Minsk was far better than the situation is today. So don't underestimate the result of Minsk delivered by the Minsk but Treaty, because for several years, Minsk delivered a better position I can't say good, but a better one than we live now. The question is, after Minsk, why the Europeans were not able to understand that we have a job to be done? That's the problem anyway. Now we start about defense industry. Now we start about European security. Why not 10 years ago, which was obvious that after Minsk, there will be a period when everybody tried to re-establish its position and Europe should have a clear-cut foreign and defense policy for today. We haven't done so anyway, so it's just in brackets. But uh, back, back, to, back to the point, uh, your point, I mean, which is very much relevant. So my conversation with the two leaders lead us or led me exactly to your point. The same argument on both sides. Because... My question was to both leaders. I'm not negotiating, you know, because I don't have a mandate to negotiate. I, am, I, I, I try to help the European leaders to understand where are the limits of the peace possibilities, you know. So I'm raising questions and collecting information and making reports to the European leaders. So I raised the question to both leaders. Is it a possibility for creation of a limited time ceasefire, which can accelerate the peace talks, and then enjoying the good consequences of an accelerated peace talks. Because now everybody's thinking just the opposite. First, we have to make a peace agreement. And when there is a peace agreement, then we can have a ceasefire. Uh, and they were not positive on that, none of them. They said exactly the same thing as you. Uh, the Ukrainians and the Russians. Ceasefire would be the interest of the other because during the ceasefire they can reorganize their position uh, in preparation to continue to war. Okay, I understand that position. But that's where the mediators has a role to, to be done. <laughs> when you met Putin, did you get the feeling that Putin thinks he's winning? It's more than that. Not he thinks. Uh, he, has a, he has a clear vision about what's going on and how Russia will, will, will win. The same with Zelensky. What does he say? Uh, the same with Zelensky. Zelensky has a clear vision in his mind explaining how Ukraine will win. How, so, does, how does Putin explain how he will win? Because he's not making big movements so far. That's very easy. Look at the realities. Figures. Sources of energy number of people and uh, soldiers. So, it, may I say, it cannot be lost. It's very logical. You mean soldiers? Yeah, soldiers, equipment, technology, which is used in a war. So, to defeat Russia is, is an idea which in Russia is, you know, it's, it's even difficult to imagine, you know. So, it's uh, Did the, you the possibility that Russia will be beaten is totally out of any calculation. Did you talk with Putin <laughs> about the fact how many Russian men died so far? I, I asked both uh, persons about the losses, lost lives and uh, casualties. And both of them were ready to say the number relating to the other one, but not for themselves. So, so they said, how is the Ukrainian losses? You can say about the Russian losses, but don't say anything about their own losses. But it's, it's, it's you know... Okay, we can think whatever we would like to think about politicians generally, or even leaders, but they are human beings. So it's, it's, it's morally extremely difficult situation to get information every day that thousands of your compatriots are dying in a war. So 
So it's not, so they are, uh, that's the reason why I'm sure that even if logically they are rather negative on, on, on quick ceasefire and they are cautious to say the truth and so on and so on, but I'm sure that at the very bottom of the things, everybody is aware that it would be better not to die tomorrow morning, any Russian and any Ukrainian. You met Putin for several hours. What do you think is his real goal right now? Is it the same as it was at the beginning of the war when he wanted you know, to conquer Kiev, um, wanted Zelensky to flee or to kill him or uh, to change the government? What was on the table when you talked to him? Um, I, I, in Europe, we regularly considered it a little bit too complicated. Now, what is the real intention? What the Russians said clearly. So we're overcomplicating the things here. Putin regularly delivers speeches. Sometimes they produce documents. I follow that. Even I read the documents. Even they had negotiation documents to the Ukrainians in uh, 2022 April uh, about how the negotiations could be run and concluded and so on. There are documents. Uh, and there are speeches. So we should take more seriously. That's the reason why I suggest to all the European leaders direct information, direct communication, diplomacy. If you don't use that, we will not understand what's going on. Well, they would argue at the beginning of the war, they tried it. Before the war started, they tried it. We all saw uh, Macron on the telephone with Vladimir Putin just before the war started. Uh, Scholz was there uh, negotiating. Um, even after the war, they were on regularly uh, phone calls, but it seemed to be that they saw it doesn't make sense. It was two years ago. Now we are in a war for more than two and a half years. The, the, the awful consequences of the war is obvious for everybody. What was two years ago, a theory, how the war looked like now is reality. That's different. Psychologically, politically, morally, everything is different. And we know how we are changing anyway, Europe. So I'm, I, I, I would not like to neglect what is the impact of the war on us. Look, look at Europe now. It was a passive, almost pacifist continent. Uh, there was no question that peace <clears throat> policy is the most important. We are getting more and more militarized. Our way of thinking, our approaches. So, so my argument is that regardless what has happened two years ago, two and a half years ago, I mean, that time attempt proved to be not successful. Now we have a lot of very bad experience of the war. This is the right time to open a new chapter and communicate directly. Did you talk to Putin about the threat? And we're talking about that for many months, actually, since the beginning of the war, that the Russian army could attack NATO, a NATO country. You know, I, I don't like to, be, to become ridiculous. So no serious man can raise any serious conversation uh, that Russia has an intention to attack NATO. Why are you so sure about that? Look at... Okay, I know the Russians. They are different than we are. You know, so it's, it's, it's totally nonsense to consider them exactly as we are and think they, they, they think exactly as we think so because they have different kind of history, different kind of culture, different kind of instinct and attitudes, different understanding of freedom, different understanding of, of, uh, of national sovereignty, uh, priority over the freedom and all that kind of very much different thing from the European mindset, yeah? Uh, but they are rational. They are hyper-rational. Uh, so, well, but if you look how, at... How, if was you, it, how was it rational, sorry to interrupt, but how was it rational to attack Kiev, I mean, in 2022? When you say the Russians are rational, then everybody would say, well, this wasn't a rational thing to do, was it? It was a miscalculation and being irrational is two different things. Uh, irrational means to do madness. Uh, miscalculation to do some mistake, calculation mistake. That's the different thing. To attack NATO by anybody, not only Russia, but anybody of the world, to attack NATO is totally impossible because NATO is far the strongest military community. It's a defense system. We are far better and stronger than anybody else. So look at how difficult it is on the front line the Russians have with the Ukrainians. What kind of possibilities and perspectives would be for Russia to attack 
NATO. You know, it's, it, it does not work. If the unity of NATO is maintained, which is the number one um, uh, precondition of our security, that Article 5 and the basic treaty of NATO must be respected by everybody. <laughs> NATO summit is coming up uh, this week. Will you talk there about your experience with both Putin and Zelensky? But this is not my plan. Uh, what I'm doing, uh, that after each meeting, I made a report to all the European prime ministers uh, and to the president of the council uh, to inform them and to make some suggestions how we could go ahead. And they have to make a decision. So, huh, okay, you should know who you are. So we are discussing a huge empire of Russia. We are discussing NATO. NATO is dominated by United States. We are, we are speaking about big European superpowers like France and Germany. So Hungary is a 10 million country. So I know exactly who are the Hungarians, where we live, what, what is our responsibility for, how we run our own policy, and what can we do on an international arena. And I cannot uh, uh, undertake more what is rational from our position, the size of the country, and so on. So I try to be as modest as I can uh, in this respect. So it's not my job to inform the NATO what's going on. You know, so that would be, well, that but they would be ridiculous. Probably, they will probably ask you when yeah, you... No, if they ask me, that's another issue. You know, so Modesty is the most important thing if you are a Hungarian. Are you surprised by the reactions of other leaders, or did you know that this would happen? Um, my, my, my point is that uh, now we are speaking a lot about strategic autonomy in Europe and we do very few things in favor of that. Because what a hell uh, strategical autonomy means if not to have our own interest-based sovereign foreign policy. And what we are doing is not discussing directly, uh, publicly, in an understandable way, what is the interest of Europe under these circumstances, but we just simply copying the American position. I think we should start to discuss a little bit more and deeper way what is the strategic interest of Europe under this circumstance, and especially after the American election. Don't forget about that. So what I'm arguing in favor is deeper understanding, discussions, to raise more alternatives to the policy line uh, in European context uh, than we have done uh, up, up to now. So, so therefore, discussion, which was generated by my trips and my future trips will also generate, is not a bad thing, is a good thing. This is a starting point to argue not only in favor of the war, but now there are more and more persons who would like to argue in favor of peace, which was not the case even one week ago. So it's a fermentation, may I say, what we need. And I think it's already started to happen. Did you tell the Ukrainian president when you met him in Kiev that you would meet Putin and was he in favor? I haven't informed anybody prior to my meetings. So, you know, sovereignty is important. If you are doing that very dedicated, sophisticated job of the peace mission, what I'm doing now, you have to maintain your sovereignty to 100%. So therefore, I do not inform anybody about what I'm doing prior to the event. After that, of course, but never prior to that. Did you talk with the Lensky or the Ukrainian government again after you met Putin? Not yet. What would you tell him? I know exactly. So what would be the next step from your perspective? No, no. The next step is, uh, is, is going on to happen uh, just soon, beginning of next week. Have you talked to Donald Trump lately? Because Trump is That's talking. a very important step. His son was here just two weeks ago. So you think Trump's going to be the next president? You know, election is election, which is the greatest puzzle of, of the earth, how an outcome of the election is finally coming out from the individual intention of millions or hundreds of millions of people. So nobody can say what will be the outcome of an election. It's a mystery.
Even in the Bible, you can find the Barabash and Jesus, you know, so, so it's very complicated. But at the same time, politics is a field of rationality as well. And what I can say that there is a very, very high chance that the next American president will be not the same president who is today. Do you think Joe Biden is mentally and physically fit to be president? I'm not a voter of the United States of America, so it's not my job to say anything on that. But uh, what I can say, Europeans should run autonomous sovereign foreign policy under this present leadership of the United States, I'm sure. Donald Trump talked a lot about a possible peace plan. He wants to um, yeah, sit down with, with, with both sides. And he said at the end he would threaten not to deliver any more weapons to Ukraine. What do you think of his plan? I think new leadership will provide new chances. So do you see things in the same way Donald Trump does? No, he's a different kind of person. And he, he, he trusts and believes more on direct communication and negotiation than the regular type of European, more intellectually oriented and intellectual background uh, policymakers. So he is, a, he is from businessmen. He's a self-made man. He has a different approach to everything. And I, uh, and I, uh, and I believe that that will be good for, for the world politics. Don't forget that he is the man of the peace. I can't, I, I'm not saying he will be the man. He, he, he is the man of peace. Under his four years term, he did not initiate a single war. And he did a lot in order to create peace in a very complicated, old, uh, conflicting uh, areas of the world. So uh, that's the reason I have a big trust. I know many Ukrainians who are very afraid that Trump becomes president and just gives Putin what he wants. He is not that kind of man. <laughs> Be sure. To give somebody what he would like to get. <laughs> that's, that's for a self-made man, is not, does not sound very logical. So do you support everything what Trump is saying regarding his plan to end the war? You know, I, I try to be very cautious because I am not just, you know, an intellectual who is writing something on politics, but I'm, I'm prime minister and I have the limit of my authority. The United States is another country. I would not like to involve into too deeply to this whole thing. I'm, but I'm speaking only what Donald Trump or the continuation of the present presidency would mean for the world. And I'm sure that a change would be good for the world. But that's all. I can't say more on that. Have you talked to the German Chancellor, Olaf Scholz, lately? And have you discussed with him your view on the war? The, prior to go to Kiev and Moscow and some other capitals soon, uh, first I visited the German Chancellor first, then the Italian Prime Minister. But you Minister, didn't tell him as well. And then, go, and then uh, uh, the French President to discuss the situation, including the war, of course. So what was the outcome of that talk? I became more informed than I was earlier. In which way? Uh, getting more their position. Uh, it's not my job to reveal any points made by the German Chancellor, but he explained his position in a very rational way. And I explained my, mine also. There was no coincidence between the two things. <laughs> Do you miss Angela Merkel? Always. <laughs> Always. You know... <laughs> It's a very funny um, thing in politics that uh, uh, because of migration, you know, I'm a strong anti-migration guy. And she was rather... I heard about that. You know, <laughs> she, she was more uh, in favor of uh, to find a technical solution for that. I had a more historical, uh, civilizational horizon to approach this issue. So therefore, we were not able to agree on migration issue and the confrontations sometimes were, were rather harsh. So... I try to be always polite, but that was very difficult anyway. So, so that was not easy. But, but uh, regardless of the migration, uh, Angela Merkel has a clear understanding of this region, not just Germany, but Central Europe. He has a clear understand she has a clear understanding what is Russia about. You know, liberal democracy in Russia and that kind of stupid approaches from many Westerners totally untouched her, you know, so it's... So she did not understand what does it mean East and Russia and history and so on. So, so she was a good partner to understand together and to, and to, uh, and to find 
common points how to understand the Eastern politics, Central Europe, how it is related to Western Europe and European Union. So her perspective was very wide and very high to discuss historical issues. You know, the, the problem in the European politics is that there's a failed, uh, mis misleading uh, understanding of political leadership. Because in Brussels and in Europe, they think that political leadership means to manage the institutions. Wow. Uh, you know, because institutions are the key of our political system and institutions are able to manage well the life of the people, which is partly true anyway, partly true, especially when things are going well. But when things are getting worse and unprecedented developments are happening, surprises coming in politics, institutions does not help. Institutions just paralyze you. You need political leaders personalities who can react, understand, and make decisions. And Angela Merkel was that kind of leader, so that's the reason of my appreciation to her. If Angela Merkel was still Chancellor of Germany, do you think the war would have, or this full-scale invasion would have happened? Would have never happened. Would have never happened. Why? Because she has a capacity and understanding and skills to isolate the conflicts which are bad for Europe. What the mistake we have done that there is a conflict, there's a war, and instead of isolating it, we escalated it and made it more and more international. That's, well, we that tried. Never... Everybody tried with Minsk, and Minsk was a failure because... We... No, no, that's your understanding yeah. of Minsk. I, I don't think so. I don't think so. Min... Oh, if you think that a political action like Minsk can solve all the problems, of course, it's a... Minsk is a failure. But if you think that there is a situation which is bad and must be managed somehow, The only relevant reference point is not how could it be good, but how cannot it be worse? And don't underestimate the situation. Now, the situation is far worse than it was after Minsk. So therefore, the Minsk situation, we appreciate, would appreciate today a Minsk situation, but now we are that level to the war. <laughs> Vladimir Zelensky said, and It's even in the law, Ukrainian law, he would never sit down with Vladimir Putin to discuss and to have uh, peace talks. What's your understanding? Will this ever happen that Zelensky and Putin will sit on one table? If the three major actors of world politics, China, United States and European Union, would like to have negotiations and peace, there will be negotiations and peace. And will that happen? We have to work on that. Peace is not coming just by self. Peace is something which must be created by somebody. Decisions on war was decision of certain persons. If, of would like, Putin. If, if we would like to have peace, we need persons who would like to have peace and make decisions in favor of peace. And we lack, uh, we have a lack of that kind of world leaders at this moment, unfortunately. How does it make you feel that now so many European politicians are criticizing you that Commentary saying you're Putin's puppet, propagandist. I even read an Applebaum saying the wife of the Polish foreign minister um, that the NATO countries should take care what they discussed on the next summit because you would um, tell it to Putin directly. They are very young ladies and guys, you know, not, a, not that old folks as I am in the job, you know. I do remember in 88, 89, when I raised the point that Russians should leave Central Europe and Hungary, and we should be as tough as we can, the Berlin Wall should come down, and we have to do it now, not 40 years later. I was heavily criticized by the leftist politicians from, from, uh, from Germany. Later on, when I said, guys, migration will change your society, by which probably you will be not happy. So think twice. I was heavily criticized. So to be criticized, I used to it. If you are a Hungarian prime minister living in a place where we live, that's part of the job. So the criticism right now and people telling you are helping Putin? I'm helping Europe. So my approach to this whole situation is how we can create a better policy for Europe. Thank you very much for your time, Mr. Prime Minister. Thank, Thank you. you very much.